Hello, everybody. This is Phil Gorski from the Critical Realism Network. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our latest web webinar on critical realism, sociology, and history. Um, our uh, speaker for today will be uh, Professor George Steinmetz uh, from the Sociology Department at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. I know that some of you have already joined us for a couple of our past webinars. If you missed those, I, I'd uh, encourage you to go take a look at our website, criticalrealismnetwork.org, and you will be able to listen to full podcasts of those past webinars and also to take a look at the PowerPoint presentations that went along with them. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, just one very quick technical note, which is that uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, the way to do that is to click on the uh, switch in the upper left hand of your screen that says ask a question. Um, if you want to chat with other participants, you're certainly welcome to use the chat box, but I would uh, not necessarily encourage that. Um, I'd rather encourage you to uh, ask questions via the, the ask a question box because those uh, are the uh, questions that we'll be looking through and uh, passing on to, uh, to George as, uh, as, the, as the webinar unfolds. And I'd also uh, just like to briefly <clears throat> um, announce that we will uh, be soliciting applications for a couple of uh, events connected to the project. In particular, we'll be doing uh, uh, another uh, philosophy of social science and critical realism uh, summer seminar um, this, this coming summer, summer. The graduate student version will be uh, the two weeks immediately before the ASA meetings in, in Seattle. Uh, and uh, those will take place, that seminar will take place in Tacoma. And uh, we're still working on the final dates for the, grad, uh, the postdoctoral version, but that is likely to be in late June. So uh, enough announcements. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn everything, uh, turn things over now to uh, Professor, Professor Steinmetz, who will uh, give us a brief presentation first, and then after uh, concluding that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be responding to questions. So I'll turn it over to you, George. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, so I wanted to uh, give something today that's a little bit, has some introductory material as well as some more detailed stuff because I know some of the people participating uh, haven't necessarily been to the workshops yet. So I'll start and you'll see that it kind of goes back and forth. Critical realism, I've been arguing for a long time, is pretty useful for historical sociologists. Critical realism, I, in, uh, in 1998, I said it's even liberating uh, for us because it provides a pretty powerful rebuttal to views of social science that prioritize the ideas of empirical invariance, of causal laws, of prediction, of parsimonious explanation, and critical realism guards against any slide into pure empiricism. Now that should not be confused with empirical research. Empiricism is something different by showing why theoretical mechanisms need to be central to all kinds of explanation, including historical ones. At the same time, critical realism suggests that contingent conjunctural causality is actually the norm in open systems like society and not an unusual condition. Therefore, parsimonious explanation is, is rarely possible. Yet critical realism's epistemological relativism leads it to accept the results of a lot of the recent history and sociology of science in a very relaxed and easygoing way uh, without giving into what Bhaskar and critical realists call judgmental relativism. In other words, an anything goes perspective on choosing uh, science, choosing models of science or explanatory theories or, or that kind of thing. Historical social researchers are reassured by critical realism of the acceptability of their already existing scientific practice often, even if it doesn't match what sometimes we could refer to as mainstream social science it misconstrues as the scientific method. Critical realism therefore kind of affirms the value of existing social research, 
one might ask then, why should a historian or a historical sociologist even bother reading this if what they're doing already conforms to a good philosophy of science anyhow? One answer to this is that philosophical, philosophical assumptions help to govern the focus of attention in the social sciences and practices of social scientists, whether they know it or not. And social scientists, as well as historians, are bombarded by different philosophies of science throughout their entire education and career. While some of these philosophical assumptions are stated explicitly, they're also often expressed more spontaneously as emanations of a kind of a scientific epistemological unconscious, or else they develop in an indirect and informal fashion. This informal approach to social science epistemology is also perhaps even more typical of historians than sociologists, which underscores Charles Tilley's membership in both of those camps. Philosophical statements crop up everywhere from introductory courses in theory, methods, and statistics um, to the comments made by teachers and even reviewers of your written work and to the ongoing daily, even spontaneous responses, even tweets nowadays by different sociologists uh, to examples of that they encounter of sociological practice and texts. We can study these almost habitual practices, I think, alongside the more explicitly articulated philosophical proposals as part of the ongoing struggles over epistemology within any disciplinary field. And indeed, I think the historical sociology of sociology itself is just as crucial for self-reflexivity as is the philosophy of social science, which is something we've been more focused on in, in the current network. I think, could we go to the next slide, please? Critical realism uh, can provide a kind of a framework for sorting out these arguments and uh, an immunization against misleading philosophies of science. And here I've put up a quote from Phil Gorski's own analogy, which I really like, between the philosophy and practice of science and the relations between theories of hydrodynamics and swimming. I think this is really illuminating. And as Phil writes, an erroneous theory of hydrodynamics could make it harder to learn swimming. Imagine if the most influential school of swimming instructors continually advise their charters to just get as big as possible when they're going through the water. Or I like his other example, a third school contends that water resistance is just a mere projection of the human mind. A few naturally talented people, he continues, might still become very good swimmers by dint of good instincts and simply a lot of practice. And they might even pass this practical knowledge on to younger swimmers, bypassing the official instructors. But they would do so in spite of the instructors, not because of them. And on a practical level, they would have to, a lot to unlearn. I think this example is really quite analogous to the situation that many historical sociologists face in contemporary sociology. Accurate knowledge of the ontology of the social world is pretty useful in helping us know which pieces of advice we should, we should take seriously and which of them we should disregard and which of them we should actively try to unlearn. In the rest of my lecture, I want to talk about three topics. First, I want to reconstruct the history of historical sociology itself. And here at the founding generations of historical sociologists, which I place in Germany between 1900 and 1933, I think we're engaged in a very explicit philosophical battle that pitted historicism, as it was called, against positivism. That was also the label used at the time. A historically accurate genealogy of historical sociology, I think, is instructive for several reasons. One is that it reveals the ways history has been treated in battles over methods and epistemology in the social sciences for quite some time. Most existing accounts of historical sociology in the United States tend to ignore this early formation for reasons that I'll try to suggest a little later. I would argue that the historicist poll in the pre-1933 configuration was compatible in many respects, although not all of them, with critical realism. In the second part of my talk, I'll sketch out some of the basic contours of the epistemological unconscious, as I have tried to call it, in contemporary US sociology. Uh, I've sometimes referred to this as methodological positivism. And I'll contrast three basic assumptions of that formation with critical realist understandings and suggest how a historical approach uh, in social science corresponds better to critical realism. And in the final part of my talk, I'll turn to comparison. Although this topic is philosophically somewhat separate from the theme of historical sociology, it has become inseparable from it, at least in the United States since the 1980s. 
the relevant section of the American Sociological Association, after all, is called the Comparative and Historical Sociology section, often abbreviated even as CHS. Note here that the adjective comparison even comes before historical. I'll argue that comparison is not essential for all historical work, but it plays indeed an essential role in the justification of theories. Okay, so turning to part one, and I've already got the slide up here, the origins of historical sociology, I'd like to start by trying to define this object. Although there were some sociologists who claimed to be doing historical work before 1900, the real start, the first original wave, if you want to use that language of historical sociology, arose in Germany between around 1900 and 1933. Before that time, the only thing resembling historical sociology were universal evolutionary models of, histor of social change. The plausibility of these models was pretty much demolished, at least in Europe, by the carnage of World War I and by the generalized crisis of European society after 1918. In addition to this contextual evidence against evolutionism, there was one key set of intellectual preconditions that made it possible for these German sociologists to move in a historical direction. Key here were the century-long movements of romanticism and historicism, and they insisted on the singularity of human culture, practices, and events, and rejected universal laws of human social evolution. Although these two movements, romanticism and historicism, existed everywhere in Europe in the first half of the 19th century, they really only survived and became quite powerful over the human sciences in Germany before 1914. The distinction between the methods that were applicable to the so-called cultural sciences and those of the natural sciences did not then originate suddenly with Windelband and Diltai, but went back to a line of thought with its origins in the revolt of the German historical school against the traditions of natural law. Academic sociology emerged within the German universities in the early 20th century in the division of the Geisteswissenschaften, or the humanities, and only in the new universities that were created after 1918, for example, in Frankfurt am Main, was there a distinct social science division. This is the context then in which Max Weber emerged, uh, and he's shown here, uh, on the slide is a, as the key inspiration for a truly interpretive historical sociology. Weber had studied Roman history for his habilitation thesis, and after 1900, he engaged seriously with the philosophy of Heinrich Rickert, all, also shown here. Rickert belonged to the Southwest German school of neo-Kantianism. He agreed with another older member of that school, Windelband, that the hum, human and the natural sciences were fundamentally different. Pindelbond had distinguished sharply between what he called the nomothetic or general law seeking and the ideographic forms of knowledge. The human sciences, all of these philosophers agreed, were inherently cultural and hermeneutic. This included sociology, along with economics, anthropology, and history. For, uh, for Windelband, the ideographic was something that was beyond explanation. Our only access to these objects was hermeneutic or interpretive. Rickert partly agreed with this. He argued that the objects studied by the human sciences were historical individuals in his term, unique singular events, institutions, communities, or humans. But Rickard disagreed with Windelband and Diltai insofar as singular events could also be explained, he argued, and Weber picked this up and agreed with this. American sociologists often acknowledge Weber's attempt to combine explanation and interpretation. They reference Weber's argument for combining generalizing and individualizing concepts. But what's been largely overlooked in the reception of Weber in the US, I think, is the central focus at the time on this idea of historical individuals. The Rickert-Weber solution, I think, is partly compatible with critical realism. I think it's also an important piece of evidence about the kind of elective affinities between historical sociology and historicist, non-positivist philosophies of science. But the particular manner in which critical realism um, understands the ontology of the social and the epistemology of social science uh, renders the Rickert-Weber synthesis more compelling. Maybe we could go to the next slide here. There are also two key differences between critical realism and Weber's version of historicism. And that Weberian version is the most influential version today in sociology, arguably. If Weber had simply stopped with the idea of the historical individual as being amenable to both explanation and interpretation, he would already be compatible with CR. But there are two other aspects of his epistemology that are less compatible. One of these is the idea, of course, of value-free science. 
I won't say anything about this today, but refer you to the work of Chris Smith, Phil Gorski, Ruth Groff, Doug Porpora, Andrew Sayer, and others. Critical realism rejects this idea of a sharp division between science and values. The other key difference between Weber and critical realism is the ideal type as a model of concept formation. I propose a critical realism alternative to ideal types, which I call real types. But before getting into that anymore, let me continue tracing the emergence of this foundational wave of historical sociology. It was Max Weber's brother, Alfred, who first used the phrase historical sociology, or more precisely, histor history sociology, Geschichtssoziologie in German, and I think this was a key naming act. There were American sociologists who had already used the phrase historical sociology before that, but they emphasized evolutionary and Darwinian approaches. Weimar history sociology was something different. And maybe we could go to the next slide. This was the first genuinely historical approach in academic sociology. It was the first form that integrated practicing historians. And several dozen historically oriented sociologists studied with Weber, Alfred Weber, at his Heidelberg University Institute during the Weimar Republic, including two of the most important ones to even today, Norbert Elias and Karl Mannheim. Historicism or neo-historicism became so compelling for the Weimar era sociologists that by 1932, Mannheim was able to declare to the other German teachers of sociology at a big meeting they all had that the historical individualizing approach, as he called it, was the crowning approach in the discipline, quote, organizing like an invisible hand the work of the cultural sciences, including sociology. The work of these historicist historical sociologists was brutally interrupted by the rise of Nazism. Most of them went into exile, mainly to the United States, and there they encountered a sociology discipline that was uninterested or even actively hostile to their historical sensibilities. Weimar historicist sociology was scattered into different disciplines and into some more marginal parts of American sociology. The two stars of Weimar historical sociology, Mannheim and Elias, Elias and encountered similar resistance in their British exile. Within Germany, Hitler helped to prove helped the presentist positivists in sociology to attain a position of dominance during the Nazi era, and they remained dominant after the war. Alfred Weber resurfaced at Heidelberg after 45, but was marginalized in sociology thanks to the support lent by collaborating sociologists and by Americans and US military occupation authorities. The sociology that emerged then after 1945 in West Germany bore little resemblance to this historicist formation before 1933. When historical sociology finally reemerged in the 1970s in the US, this had almost no connections to the earlier for German formation. There were a few alternatives though, and a few alternative philosophical frameworks that could provide historical sociologists with arguments against the kind of neo-positivism dominant at the time. One of them that was chosen by most of the historical sociologists, as Adams, Orloff, and Clemens have argued in Remaking Modernity, was Marxism. But the problem is that Marxism and neo-Marxism did not have a single position on the key questions of historical epistemology that concern us here. Marxism was divided between universalizing evolutionary approaches and philosophies closer to the neo-historicism described earlier. Another possibility for people coming out in the 1970s and 80s in historical sociology was the French historical school that had been so influential for Pierre Bourdieu. But for reasons too detailed to go into today, the reception of that philosophical orientation of Bourdieu's into the English speaking world didn't occur until very recently. A third possibility was the critical realism of Roy Bascar. And so here we finally come to Bascar. And when I myself came up in the 1980s as a historical sociologist, I first turned to Bascar in order to defend the kind of work that I was already doing in graduate school. Since I was lucky enough to be taught by historians as well as sociologists, and had associated myself with the historicist branch of the Charles Tilley School of Historical Sociology, my work didn't really follow the pseudo-experimentalist design that was being defended at the same time uh, within comparative historical sociology, nor did I really embrace what at the time was known in broader social science discussions as the comparative method, which treated the names of places and periods as variables and looked for constant conjunctions of events. Although Bhaskar was not being read by historians nor by really by historical sociologists at the time, 
he did seem to provide the philosophical tools for a defense of the historical case study as both explanatory as explanatory and as therefore being scientific and historical realism critical realism made sense of the actual practice of most historians and historical social scientists so now i want to turn to part two on critical realism and historical sociology and let me backtrack for a moment and summarize what i mean by sociological positivism so that the differences from critical realism become clear a somewhat watered down version of positivism is still widespread in american social science and this mainstream social science positivism i think is primarily defined by some sort of a search for humean style constant conjunctions of events that is by an ontological belief in what roy baskar called regularity determinism this is the core of contemporary sociological positivism. Critical realism provides a pretty powerful rebuttal to this doctrine of universal covering laws. I assume this is pretty familiar to most of the people listening today, but let me just say that critical realism, as I understand it, argues that the social is an open system inhabited by a rainforest-like profusion of causal powers, to use Andrew Collier's phrase, which interact in both patterned and in contingent accidental ways. In open systems, unlike in the artificial closure of the experimental situation, causal mechanisms combine producing events conjuncturally, that is to say in concert with other mechanisms. This means that complexity and nuance, as opposed to parsimony or causal reductionism, is better suited to realistically describing the actual determination of social events in most cases. I guess we could go to slide six now. Conjunctural and contingency-based explanations are the most appropriate ones for capturing the ontological specificity of social reality. Conjunctural in this context means overdetermined. Complex events are co-determined or overdetermined by constellations of mechanisms. The word contingency in this context implies that these constellations are not repeatable in a general way in many cases and that the components that make up the causally effective constellation of causes may vary across events or instances of a given event. Generative mechanisms or structures have to be studied in the wild, as it were, and to complicate matters even further, they often appear in impure forms mixed up with other causal powers or mechanisms, and this is indicated by case two in the diagram here from Baskar, in which three causal mechanisms are shown as combining in a nexus, M1, 2, and 3, along with a fourth lone wolf kind of causal mechanism coming in from the left in producing an event. Current positivism in sociology, to move back to my topic, has three other main features, again, which can be contrasted with critical realism in useful ways, shedding light on the way historical sociology should and often is conducted. First, Positivism, as defined primarily by regularity determinism here, is often combined with actualism, also referred to as empiricism. And this is an ontological stance denying the existence of underlying structures, entities, or powers, or denying any access to them. It locates the succession of cause and effect entirely at the surface of these events. There are some regularity determinists, however, who admit the existence of underlying unobservable or theoretical structures and allow them to determine empirical events. Rational choice theory sometimes takes the form of a depth realist positivism, and some rational choice theorists reject regularity determinism. Actualism is thus a widespread, but I don't think a necessarily defining feature of current sociological positivism. It's opposed by ideas of ontological stratification and emergence in critical realism. I won't go through emergence since we've heard Phil Gorsky's lecture on that topic already, but let's just say that critical realism is opposed to the forms of reductionism that assert the unreality of these causal strata. Um, this leads to a radically different understanding of the meaning of causal laws in critical realism. Within critical realism, a law is not a constant conjunction of events, but it's the characteristic pattern of activity or tendency of a mechanism. I think we could go to slide seven now. More specifically, real structures, 
possess causal powers which, when triggered or released, act with natural necessity and universality as generative mechanisms. Social theory is then concerned with these underlying causal powers. This is where I think a distinction between Weberian ideal types and what I would call real types comes in. Weber's methodological solution, the ideal type, I think differs from the critical realist position insofar as the latter does not seek first to resolve a complex event into its components through abstraction, the Weberian approach proceeding from there via the process of retroduction to descriptions of relations between these events and some underlying postulated causal powers. Instead, the ideal type, as I understand it, resolves a complex event in a different way. It willfully accentuates certain aspects of the event rather than seeking to identify the event's essential characteristics or determinants, and it does not assume the ontological layering emergence that necessitates a move from the event level to the mechanism level. The actualist or empiricist is unconcerned with the powers or tendencies of underlying causal mechanisms, but only with the correlations of empirical indicators. But social theory in critical realism is not a mere redescription of empirical regularities. Social science, including historical social science, combines theory and explanation. So now I've talked about regularity, determinism, and actualism, and I want to turn to a sec another feature of positivism, which I think distinguishes it from critical realist understandings of social science and therefore historical social science, which is the difference between a critical naturalism and a plain old naturalism. In other words, an equation of the social sciences with the natural sciences. Critical realism argues the differences between the natural and the social sciences are rooted in real ontological differences between the objects that they study. And there are four key sorts of differences. All four of these are congruent with specifically historical sociology as I've defined it already and as I think the Weimar historicists already described it. The most distinctive of these ontological differences is one that was at the core of German historicism and other historicisms. This is the idea of the concept dependency, to use Baskar's terms, of the causal powers and the events in social science. Unlike natural structures, Social structures do not exist independently of the agent's conceptions of what they're doing. More precisely, social structures don't play a causal role independently of uh, people's attributions of meaning to them. It may be true that the meanings change, for example. Uh, for example, when we perceive or reuse the ruins of a lost civilization, it may also be the case that the material artifacts of a prior culture have certain kinds of affordances, to use the term central to Webb Keen's new book, Ethical Life, and not others, regardless of the meanings that went into producing them. But what affordances means in this context is that there will be certain limits placed on meanings that can be attached to an object. It doesn't determine exactly what those meanings will be. Even here, the causal role of these artifacts at any given moment is consubstantial with the meanings that we attach to them. All of this means that an interpretive dimension is intrinsic to social research. Concept dependency also provides another nail in the coffin of the Humean constant conjunctions model because human beings are able to learn from their own practices and from the social structure and to learn about the social structures in which they're active and may therefore try to change these deliberately. Social science itself leads to changes in the behavior of the people it studies. And a historical approach is essential then for studying these kinds of dialectical movements between structure and agency. And here we can go to the next slide. Baskar already suggested this in his very earliest work using the model that he called the transformational model of social activity. A second key difference between the naturalism of the naturalist naturalism and the critical naturalism is that the social and natural sciences differ in terms of the greater historical and geographical specificity of the causal powers within the social sciences as opposed to the natural ones. Again, this is relative and not absolute. A third difference is between the social, excuse me, between the social and the natural sciences is that the causal powers described within the social sciences are practice dependent. That is, they don't, depend, they don't exist independently of human action and practice. 
Thus, while we may speak abstractly of a space, a field, or a network of social positions, these don't exist independently of the practices that they ground. And the final differences, difference between the social and the natural that distinguishes between critical, na critical naturalism and naturalist naturalism concerns the deep connections between ethics and social science. Again, I'm going to bracket this topic now. Let me turn to the last defi defining feature of soci sociological positivism and distinguish it from critical realism. And I think this is somewhat separate from the first two. I call this scientism. It's not my term, but I think it's applicable here. And what scientism means is that the real or imagined natural sciences are taken as guides for the methods and even the aesthetics of sociology. I've already covered some of this under the headings of constant conjunctions, actualism, and simple or naturalist naturalism. But there are other aspects of scientism. For example, scientism prefers parsimonious accounts and calls them elegant, as if what was being described here was a new car or even a spaceship. The constant conjunctions model, by contrast, does not insist that the explanatory variables should be few in number. Another example concerns quantitative methods. There's nothing inherently positivist about this at all. Statistics can make crucial contributions to describing what Tony Lawson calls demi-regularities of practice. And I view statistics in my own work as have other critical realists. But they have always, I think, to be combined with interpretive methods, since meaning is as inseparable from the existence of these practices, events, and artifacts as one side of a piece of paper is from the other. Quantitative data and statistics are often preferred because simply because they have a veneer of science. Now, part three of my comments, I want to turn to the question of comparison. As I mentioned, the domination of methodological positivism in sociology and other social sciences in the US since World War II has meant that scientific or analytic qualitative research as such has come to be identified with comparison. In a 2002 book, Mahoney and Ruschmeyer are especially interested in distancing comparative historical analysis from what they describe as mere case studies or ideographic research. Critical realism distinguishes among the activities of comparison, explanation, and theory, and suggests that social science explanation doesn't need to involve comparison at all, even if comparison is part of this overall combined process of science. Like classic historicism, critical realism acknowledges the irreducible singularity of some historical events. Social life is understood within critical realism as an open system, as I've mentioned, in which a multiplicity of causal mechanisms or more complex structures interact in a contingent way, generating empirical events. The explanation of a unique event involves constructing a plausible model of the contingent conjuncture of causal structures that combine to generate that event. The historian or historical sociologist then engages in a retroductive analysis in order to assess the mo model's plausibility. Retroduction, as it's defined here, involves inference from effects to explanatory structures. It's a form of inference to the best explanation that infers by answering questions like what made X possible, where X is the event. A retroductive argument is one that necessitates the building of a model of the mechanism, which if it were to exist and to act in the, post in the postulated way, could account or would account for the phenomenon concerned. Now, if you think of it this way, a case study is perfectly capable of explaining a single event. Nonetheless, comparison is valued, and I think it should be valued even within critical realism, and it has to be valued as a means of assessing the plausibility of inferences or theories. The ontological peculiarities of social life mean that the case study is a precondition for any comparative assessment of theory. The case study and comparison are inseparable. The plausibility of a theoretical argument can only be assessed through the study of complex, overdetermined empirical cases. Cases or events are the indispensable building block for social science. Case studies can, should not be relegated to the ideographic then or construed as raw data waiting to be processed by a nomothetic theory machine. The only way to gain confidence in the plausibility of theoretical causal structures in the longer term, however, is through comparison, specifically through comparative case studies, 
or other forms of reasoning, such as counterfactual reasoning based on evidence. Comparative history takes two main forms, and these are arguably located at the levels of the real and the empirical. And I want to conclude my comments today with this summary of two of the articles I think that were pre-distributed to people listening in today, where I talk about these two kinds of comparison. One of these is comparison across the event level, and one of these is comparison across the level of causal powers. Um, I suggest both of these are fruitful kinds of comparison. It's the comparison across empirical events that is usually thought of as the comparative method, however. Comparison across theoretical mechanisms, or what I sometimes have called depth realist comparison, differs from empiricist or actualist versions of comparison in that it's quite happy to juxtapose and contrast and compare events or individuals that seem to have very little in common at the empirical level. In some ways, then, this depth realist comparison violates the more historicist historical approaches to comparison associated with the historian Mark Bloch, for example, in his book on the historical method. What unites the cases, at least hypothetically in this approach, the depth realist comparative approach, is the effectivity of some social structure or causal mechanism. The goal of explanation is to inve investigate the vicissitudes of this conceptual mechanism across differing concrete cases, contexts, or events. Indeed, since, since events are the result always of overdetermined and contingent conjunctions of causal mechanisms, in critical realism at least, they're always singular in some respects. Every event is singular. And the macro events that are the most significant historically and that are the most significant to the wider public that reads our work, hopefully, events such as the French Revolution or the Holocaust are the least amenable to grouping into types. This is then one of the main reasons why I think we need to really think about both kinds of comparison because these kinds of singular events have been, for reasons that are not entirely, I think, conscious to sociologists, excluded from sociological research for a long time because of their uniqueness. The second approach is the more familiar. This involves comparing cases that are empirically similar, and this is actualist comparison. Here we compare a series of events constructed as empirically commensurable with one another. The positivist comparative method, called macro-causal analysis sometimes, is really identical to actualist comparison at the level of the basic selection of cases, though not in other terms. Even when, where there are identifiable types of empirical objects, we can't assume that each instance is determined by the same concatenation of causes. Indeed, a research project that were constructed solely along the lines of actualist comparison and conducted with careful attention to the complex structures of causality is just as likely to transform itself into a series of parallel case studies tracing different patterns of causality as it is to find a single invariant causal configuration. So I think I'll stop there. If people would like to, me to give any empirical examples of this, I'd be happy to do that. But let's see what the questions are that might arise from this. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, George. Uh -huh. um, thank you very much, George. This is Phil again. Hi, Phil. Uh, so I, I think I'll actually lead off with, with, a, with a question for you. Okay. This is a topic that you and I have talked about um, off and on, though, though never uh, at great length or, or in great depth. But the, 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 I'd like to get you to say a little bit more about your, your current thinking about what, uh, what a real type methodology would, uh, would look like. So what would be um, in your mind, for example, that the procedures that you would use to construct a real type, um, what sorts of evidence would you look for um, to confirm or disconfirm the, the operation of a particular particular uh, of a particular real type? Um, <clears throat> so, any, and just in general, any thoughts you might have about um, how we might go about developing this uh, a kind of a real type methodology as an alternative to the kind of standard ideal type methodology that we got from Weber? Well, I guess I would start by saying that um, I, the way I'm trying to think about science doesn't require that 
one individual accomplish all of the tasks. And um, obviously with, with retroduction and the dialectic of evidence and theory, there's a kind of a collective effort as well. And I think it's important for the real type discussion too. That said, um, I think it's kind of like Phil with your example of swimming that you might be able to construct a real type even though you thought you were doing an ideal type, but if you're aware of the differences, you might be led somewhere differently. And the fact that the ideal type methodology often involves this idea of um, a willful accentuation of certain aspects of whatever it is you're studying, and also that I think it is premised on an ontology that doesn't make an explicit distinction between the levels of causal powers and the levels of event, the level of events, could lead you down a different path. And um, so it's more of an orienting, uh, I think it's more of an orienting statement than anything else. But it, at the abstract level, a real type would be one that captures as well as possible the real structures either of the event or of the or if you're constructing a real type that is supposedly about a causal power it would be that picture or image or model that you construct to capture as well as possible what it is now it's clear from baskar that he does not he explicit reject, explicitly rejects any correspondence theory of science the idea that scientific models literally are mirrors of nature we're not talking about that, but there is a dialectical process by which hopefully through judgmental rationality, we can come closer and closer. And I think a real type orientation accepts that. And the ideal type uh, orientation, I think is rooted in a, in a different philosophy of science. But I'm, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about that, Phil, too. And maybe- well, I'm not the only- I'm not the only one who's interested in this question. I have a, another question that's come in asking um, that uh, that we um, focus on on some concrete examples. So here, here's one thought that I have. I, I wonder, for instance, whether some of Weber's most famous ideal types might actually be um, reinterpreted as real types and that it's precisely the fact that they are uh, tacitly real types which makes them so powerful. So let me just give you one example which would be the uh, the different different forms of um, the different forms of legitimate domination or, or legitimate authority, right? Charismatic, traditional, bureaucratic, uh, something that everybody who does kind of comparative historical, political, transnational sociology it is going to be going to be familiar with, and um, if, if you sort of drill down, um, what underlies those uh, those different typologies is um, changing relational and ideological configurations uh, between actors and institutions, or something like that, right? And that um, you know what you're what you're really trying to get at then is. Uh, the difference might be something like this, that an ideal type <clears throat> looks at as many possible cases of something as uh, as it can, bureaucracy, charisma, whatever, and then looks for some kind of least common denominator or, you know, sort of, you know, things that recur very, very frequently and then uh, constructs a list of those things, whereas... It, what a real type methodology would more might more explicitly do would be it would, it would say, well, um, you know, what are sort of the things that are essential to that kind of authority? In other words, if this relationship were not the way that it is, or this particular actor were not the way that they are, then it wouldn't be the kind of authority that it is. Does that make make it? Does that make any sense? So that you're thinking more in terms of uh, uh, of what what particular entities in relation generate a particular kind of uh, social or ca social causal power, as opposed to just looking for you know regularities or you know things that recur frequently in different contexts. I think that's that's a really interesting way to start the discussion, and it points to um, one thing that the the Weberian approach doesn't do, which is distinguish between the causal powers or mechanisms level and the events level. And you know, presumably, if you're um, uh, 
trying to generate a, a real type, you could be doing that at, at either level. And you could discuss the concepts that we're trying to invent in the social sciences, like the unconscious or fields or exploitation or whatever, as, as kind of real types as well. But to go back to your examples, I think those there you see that we probably need a critical realist approach to creating empirical level type typologies as well. And that's a little less um, obvious what that looks like, I think, possibly, unless you wanted to select out the aspects of a complex concatenated um, nexus of events that are more causally related to the causal mechanisms. So if we could go back to the slide that I had from Roy Baskar's Human Emancipation book for a moment, I can maybe make it clear what I'm trying to say. If you can go back, I think, to slide number five or six, the nexus slide. Yes, so if, if you look at the one, I, I talked about case two, but case four has multiple determinations of events as a nexus in an open system. So you see E is an event, but it's an event he's trying to diagram it as a complex event instead of a simple event. And uh, I, I think that that's one way we could think about this is we're trying to get the essential points of that triangle, the ones that are connected to causal mechanisms. That would be another approach. A real type would be one that instead of abstracting out and willfully selecting the aspects of E that are just arbitrarily interesting to us, we could try to motivate them a little more seriously in terms of their relationship to causal determinants that are not just our own willfully uh, invented ones, but that have some kind of a program going on uh, connecting to other scientists that gives them some greater plausibility through the, the, compar the kind of thing I was talking about at the end through a number of different comparative, uh, a number of different empirical cases that can then be added up and compared or used as evidence. Does that make any sense that you, so you've got a, you've got E in case four and you've got M in case two and both of them are represented as complex nexuses and a real type presumably would try to capture um, the more essential aspects of them. Um, so let, let me, uh, let me ask you a slightly different question here, George. Um, so I was, I was kind of struck by the, um, the diagram that uh, came relatively early. This is the transformational model of social action, and we might be able to get that back up on the, on the screen. <clears throat> uh, because it, it, it looks an awful lot like uh, the, the Coleman boat, the micro-macro, or macro micro macro model, mm -hmm. um, but I was one of the things that jumped out at me in looking at it this time is that um, the arrows between two and three and four and whatever that is t two um, are exactly vertical, which they're not in the case of the Coleman boat. I mean the Coleman boat they're they're slanted <laughs> and I think this is this is actually, this is really significant um, because what this model is implying is that there are kinds of causes that are simultaneous with their effects, as opposed to preceding or following. Do you know what I do? You see what I'm saying? Uh, I see what you're saying diagrammatically. I'm trying to think about what what it might be for a causal effect to be simultaneous as opposed to a, 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 a time gap between them. Well, I think you know we we tend uh, this comes back a little bit to something that um, that we were talking about in, in the emergence webinar, which is um, you know we tend to think of um, causation in terms of this what I kind of derisively call the billiard ball ontology, which is causation is uh, all occurring at one level or on one plane. It, it occurs in a in a two-dimensional space as, as opposed to a three-dimensional space, which is to say that it, it um, in classical terms, it's all efficient causality. Whereas mm -hmm. what this diagram of, of Royce's is, is opening up is the possibility of something like formal causation. That is where um, 
the important effect here is, is the way in which, uh, say, a new structure that's created at, uh, at juncture one um, and um, gradually becomes instantiated, then fundamentally transforms, um, say, activity which is occurring at the level of, of practice at, at T3, right? Yes. Um, right, and this is, this is a possibility that's not really there, I think, in the, in the standard Coleman boat example, which suggests um, that uh, what happens at the structural level is somehow affecting people by their observation of what's going on and their knowledge of what's going on, whereas, you know, oftentimes um, the way in which structures operate, it, you know, is at least for a time, as it were, behind, behind people's backs without them knowing by structuring their interactions and ways in which they might not not be fully aware of. Yeah, I think that is entirely correct. I mean, I agree with that interpretation of the difference between the Coleman atomistic one, which is really a kind of an atomism that uh, the level above there is not is not emergent from the level below. That that distinction, I totally agree with. Yeah, right, and it so, uh, is uh, it is remarkable that they look so similar, but <laughs> they are they mean something different. Yeah, this is the Baskar boat, if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It seems to be a somewhat more old-fashioned boat with square sides or something like that. But uh, the Basker boat and the Coleman boat are, are uh, there are some really important differences that don't immediately, um, you know, jump to jump into your eyes. So, yeah, and the I verticality have, uh, that you're talking about could be, in a, if you interpret it the way you do, I think that builds it into a more important difference between the two. I like that. So and that's a, a kind of a, a weird thing to talk about in a, histor in, a, in a discussion of historicism and historical because it's about a simultane simultaneity. And Coleman's looks superficially more historical because it has the tilting arrows and time's arrow seems to be driving it in that way. So I have a, I have a, a more skeptical question now for you, George, uh, from, from one of the participants. Um, who, uh, who asks, first of all, uh, an important part of your argument for critical realism is that it legitimates the kind of historical analysis you're already doing, particularly its constant conjunction view of causation. But that's not a reason why a skeptic might choose to adopt CR. Is there any way to use your work or that of others to demonstrate the accuracy of at least some elements of critical realism, or must it be adopted a priori? Um. Let's let's. Could you, Phil, uh, try to elaborate on this a little? I, they they think I'm using it just to legitimate my own work, or or one possible reading would be that I've adopted a philosophy that makes it look legitimate. And are there any other cases of historians or historical work that would make sense in terms of this? Or well, I, I mean, I, I guess the the question is whether there's some way in which you know empirical historical research could, um, if not prove, uh, at least um, corroborate some of the basic assumptions of, of critical realism, which, you know, I would say are about things like how, uh, you know, how causation actually works in the social world or uh, that there are strong, firms, strong forms of structural oh, emergence see. in the social world. Well, there are very good ones, and in a way, I didn't have time to talk about those, but perhaps the most powerful one that's emerged in the last 100 years in which unobservable causal entities that are emergent from biology have been shaping events is the whole field of psychology and especially psychoanalysis in which, and we now know from even cognitive neuroscientists that there is unconscious cognitive processes going on. So we don't even have to question that any longer. And we know that if we had a model, as we did 100 and some years ago, of unconscious processes shaping events, thoughts, symptoms, whatever, we could make sense of them in ways that we didn't, ha that we couldn't without emergence. So check that one off. I think you know emergence and the distinction of onto the ontological stratification uh, in for the social sciences that seems to follow from that. Although you need other examples, I would point to the entire structuralist revolution in the mid 20th century as pointing to things like social fields as 
objects that are not immediately observable that clearly seem to shape behaviors in ways that aren't completely predictable, but nonetheless causal. Um, I'm sure we could come up with all sorts of others. So that, you know, that level, the ontological um, stratification between the real and the event level, as for the contingents, as for the fact that the social is an open system with multiple causal mechanisms and that they're often combining to produce outcomes, I think anyone who reads the history of any major event will be struck on, struck by the, the quick death of single factor explanations. You know, if, whether you're talking about trying to explain the French Revolution or the Nazi Holocaust or the collapse of the world economy more recently in 2008, any of these, uh, when, uh, although the first two are better researched now, so let's stick to those. Uh, the reductionist single factor models have collapsed, suggesting the need for more than one mechanism. And then in terms of, I don't know how many of these different distinctions we want to go through, but uh, maybe you could ask the person whether they're skeptical about the differences between naturalism, naturalist naturalism and critical naturalism, but it seems to me that that one has been fairly decisively decided upon, that you can't just study social practices and social processes as if they were thing-like without understanding the meanings that are attributed to them. The, the fact that causal powers uh, emerge historically and are not as trans-historical as they're thought to be in some sciences, as I think there's some good evidence for the rise of things like we have in the social sciences, the rise of capitalism or the rise of the modern state as examples of that. So I'm, I'm, I guess those are some of the ways I would go, but it, it's a fairly broad question. Maybe it could be rendered a little more, maybe the skepticism could be made a little bit more precise so that I could figure out what I'm supposed to be responding to. I think um, an, another concern that this person has expressed is one that we hear often, which is um, do all, are all of the elements of, of critical realism um, a package such that you have, if you accept one element, you necessarily have to accept another. And they're in particular concerned with um, whether accepting a powers account of causation and a strong version of social emergence necessarily entails a rejection of the fact value distinction. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Well, as a general argument, I would say that one of the things Baskar hit, hit the nail on the head with was that um, even if we refuse sort of the relativist accounts of, the, of theory choice, we have to acknowledge now that we've had hundreds of years of the history of sciences that science is always changing and always embedded within contexts as well and, and not simply a process of getting ever closer to its truth that that must be true of everything that we do, including critical realism. So the idea that it's a package that one has to accept would fly in the face of every other theoretical program that has ever been developed. And so no, of course it's not a package. And I think there's even been evolution in the last few years over the course of the discussion that we've been having in the critical realism network and the ways certain people have been approaching different questions. As for the values, question. I didn't talk about that here because that's more the, the specialty of people like Phil, but it seems to me that Baskar's original formulation, which is that you can do something called by, that by crit, criticizing or by, by ex, you can do an explanatory critique that by pointing to social structures that systematically produce false knowledge about the world, that in, automatically yields an ethical program of eliminating that program. I think that has been pretty, dis, pretty unsatisfying for many people as, the, as, as, as if that were all that could be said about uh, the program and Baskar himself elaborated on that further. So there's been, there's no sense of it being a static program and I don't think there's, if we wanted to really get into Baskar himself and I think Tim or someone, Tim Rutzo or someone who's a real a Baskarian would be better, better able to cover that question, but I don't think his work was static either. Well, let me just, just jump in and amplify on two points that you made, George, about ways in which I think critical realism has changed um, just in recent years. So 
One is a shift um, from talk about causal mechanisms to causal powers. That's right. Um, and this is actually something that we'll be exploring in greater depth at, uh, you know, at a conference later on in March. But I do think this, this is a really, really quite significant shift just because it moves us away uh, from the kind of mechanistic and physicalistic and regular, regularistic language um, or, or implications of the mechanisms con concept, uh, mechanisms concept itself. And I think a further thing is that if one uh, embraces some version of, of a critical naturalism, I think that it does imply that one is adapting some limited version of a naturalistic ethics, right? Um, so this is not a kind of imperative ethics, a thou shalt or thou shalt not kind of ethics, but more a kind of prudential ethics of um, that um, these are the conditions under which human beings or human communities do do well or ill, and that this is, in fact, uh, not a, just a sort of a purely relativistic or subjectivistic question. This is a question which, within some limits, is something that we can actually, you know, that has some objective reality that can actually actually be studied. Um, this doesn't mm -hmm. mean that, uh, you know, we're going to come up with some kind of a blueprint for a perfect society, but I think, you know, that's, that's a sense in which there probably is a sort of a deep an inherent connection between uh, questioning the fact value distinction and embracing uh, a critical naturalism, right? I, I, I do think that those things really do follow on from, from one another. Um, and we should have Webb Keen come on and talk about this. I think this, his new book um, is, uh, I think, just a fantastic attempt to sort of, um, you know, thread the needle in between relativism and moral relativism and moral universalism. So we'll put that on our to-do list, right? You have to talk, you have to chat web up for us. Yeah. Um, and I think it would be, I think the point you just made would be an interesting one to relate to already existing distinctions in critical realism. For example, we distinct, we've always distinguished between a, a sort of a, a meta um, theory of what a social science has to do and has to be if it's going to be an acceptable social science and a substantive social set of social theories about the actual causal powers that exist and things like that, so that there's no necessary social theory that's connected to social to critical realism. And it was it was important, I think, to make that move because of the early connections between critical realism and and Marxism, which not necess which isn't necessarily. Um, a necessary social theory that necessarily goes hand in hand with critical realism, arguably. And I think the same thing could be said for what you just did, Phil, with, uh, with uh, ethics and critical realism, that it seems to imply that if there is some kind of set of, cause, set of powers in human beings that there would stem from that some kind, of, some kind of ethical stance, but it doesn't prejudge the issue of what they are. And I think it, it goes back to the earlier question of whether this is a package or not. Maybe, maybe we need to distinguish between a package of, of meta, meta claims and a package of substantive claims. And I think the substantive theoretical claims are more open, obviously more open to research. Couldn't agree more. So I'm going to uh, here's a here's a nuts and bolts methodological question for you, George, okay. which is ab about case selection. So um, if we go back to the old million Scotch polian quasi experimental account of what historical and comparative explanation consists of, um, then that gives us a certain certain rationale for, for selecting cases. And I think that the question is about, well, if, if we really move away from that to a critical realist um, approach to historical sociology, then how do we know um, which cases we, it would be important or, or useful to compare and how do we, on what basis do we make those judgments? Well, I, first of all, I don't agree that the Millian uh, method did give us guidance for case selection, except in this, if we accepted that we can do only method of difference and agreement and we should accept only cases in which every variable except one was different and, and the opposite. But that doesn't seem to me a very good version of case selection since it maps so poorly onto the empirical world, the real world. Um, 
but um, case selection, I think, should be a, could be approached in a couple of different ways. I talked about comparisons across causal powers or depth realist comparison versus actualist comparison. Actualist comparison, to start with that, I think this is where Weber's, you know, going back to Weber's writings on the fact value distinction, he was on to one thing, which is that there, there are certain events that are humanly important to us. And these may be um, humanly important for reasons that you were just talking about, Phil, in terms of an, a realist ethics, but we don't know that yet. What we do know is that some of the most humanly important events were systematically um, downplayed as possible objects of analysis in sociology because they didn't fall into, um, they weren't repeated events and they didn't seem to be uh, amenable to that. So that's a different approach to case selection than one that seems to be based on a kind of a statistics model of case selection. As for the, act, as for the um, depth realist case selection, here I think you, you start from your interest in a certain set of causal powers or a single causal power. Let's say you're interested in, in Bourdieu's field theory. What you will try to do is think about what kinds of cases that field, that approach suggests you should look at, where you would expect fields to emerge, where you would expect certain features of fields to emerge. For example, you would expect certain kinds of practices to be more autonomous or capable of achieving auto relative autonomy and others to be more pulled toward heteronomy, toward dependence on the economy or the state. And you would probably want to systematically do comparative depth analysis, depth realist analysis, looking at field formation in those two different kinds of situations. You look at the field of poetry and the field of architecture, for example. In the field of poetry, you would expect to be able to attain a, a deep set of, sort of autonomy uh, precisely because of, uh, of the low resources, economic resources and political resources required to do poetry. And you'd look at architecture as one that's likely to be pulled into heteronomy. And then you might have other um, hypotheses about the kinds of social properties that lead toward different patterns of, auto of, of asymmetry or domination and subordination within those fields. So I don't think case selection is a problem. I just think it works in a completely, it would work in a completely different way from the way that the million model suggested it should work, which always seemed utterly artificial and to have almost nothing to do with how actual historians, or for that matter, even human beings, think about how they should study the social world. All right, so we have a couple of questions um, about mechanisms. Um, and in, in particular, um, how the critical realist approach to causal mechanisms differs from other approaches that are out there, say the, the kind advocated by analytical sociology or the kind advocated by contentious politics, school a la Tilly. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is, um, also uh, a related question, which is, must mechanisms be unobservable? And if so, why? Okay, well, I'll start with the first one. No, unobservable is just something that's always, that needs to be mentioned because it's permitted for them to be unobservable, not because they have to be unobservable. And that, that flows directly from the history of science and is pretty clear that um, in the social sciences, given the unobservability of many of the most powerful causal powers that have been identified in social theory, social class, for example, in social science have not been observable, but by no means does it need to be unobservable. No, so that's, that's easy. It, what it is is carving out a space for, social, for, for causal powers that may not be immediately palpable, empirically observable, or that may involve um, abstraction from the empirical, but they may also involve a move toward the empirical. Um, so no, they don't have to be unobservable. On the, on the first question, um, I think the main distinction there is in terms of this um, criterion of actualism that um, the contentious politics a la Tilly and the, um, was a cataloging of things that we would in critical realism probably describe as more uh, 
actual level or empirical level um, phenomena, or at the very best, uh, at the very least, I guess, didn't make a, a distinction between those two. And I think that is absolutely how Tilly himself thought about it, because I talked to him about that. He did not accept the critical realist approach, but wanted to adopt a mechanism's language. And it was pretty clear that it was a distinct one from that. And then the analytical sociology, I don't um, quite um, uh, understand exactly what's meant by it there, but it seems to me it's also an empirical level phenomenon. But maybe someone who's listening in now can correct me. That's the way I've understood it as empirical. So a mechanism is what we would call um, a, a, a conjunction of events. It may not be a constant conjunction. It may be a concatenation of, con constant of, of, of conjunctions in an analytical narrative. But um, I've, been, I've tried to be pretty explicit that I don't think rational choice theory is empiricist. So to the extent that analytical sociology is combined with rational choice theory, I think it would violate that. I think rational choice theory can be, um, because it involves an abstract, unobservable, to use that term again, language about a causal mechanism such as rationality, um, automatically breaks with actualism and empiricism. And to the extent that certain kinds of more complex game theoretical forms of rational choice theory don't involve constant conjunctions of events, it's at that level completely compatible with critical realism. It's just that the limiting of the substantive theory to a theory of rationality is one that I would reject but I don't think it's incompatible with the meta theory of critical realism. Yeah, just to sort of respond to that very briefly, I mean, I think it is the case that um, properly understood rational choice theory does um, involve theoretical non-observables. Rationality preferences are, are another good example of this. These are not things that can be directly directly observed, but that we postulate based on things that, that we can that we can observe. But I think in some cases, what rational choice theory does, and this is certainly true of analytical sociology, is that it hides behind um, an empiricist self-justification. Says we're just talking about individuals. Individuals are things that you can actually see, unlike say social structures which you can't, but of course you can't see a preference any more than you can see a social structure. So I think that there, there's a way in which, a, you know, a, a certain construal of rational choice theory could be read in, 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 um, in, in critical realist terms, but that it's incompatible to the degree that it rejects the idea of, of, of social structure. Also, just have a, a sort of a quick thought about the mechanisms versus powers thing. I mean, one idea would actually be um, to think of mechanisms as one species of power. Mm -hmm. And um, and in the, here you would think of a, a mechanism as being like the mechanism inside of a clock. In other words, it's it's something that's operating, um, you know, outside of or beyond. Um, the normal person's powers of observation operating behind social actors' backs, if you will. And I think that was, in fact, one of the intents, right, of uh, the mechanisms concept to begin with and, and sort of basic critical realism. I mean, it was partly intended as a critical concept. So the idea is, for example, exploitation, the classic example, is that, you know, people misconstrue uh, labor relations in terms of wage labor and free contracting when in fact what's actually going on is the extraction of surplus value. Well, that's a, that's a way of using the idea of a causal mechanism in a, in a critical way um, as opposed to a, a purely explanatory way. But of course, there are powers in the social world um, of which we're perfectly well aware um, and of which we have a completely accurate picture. And so mechanism would just be that particular case of a, of a causal power which is operating, you know, behind the backs of actors and usually is abetted by a systematic misconstrual or misrecognition of, of what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's excellent. And um, I think that's obviously key to, as you were pointing out to Marx and to many other top-notch social theorists like Bourdieu, they, had, they, they begin with that idea of 
of um, moving beyond the level of appearances or spontaneous sociologies and looking at causal things going on behind the backs. The word is burdened by the connotations, but there needs to be some word for that kind of thing. And then there can be powers which are much more visible. So this could go to the non-observable discussion earlier. The third term is, is structures or social structures. Um, structures are often observable, are, are more empirical level. Um, I guess even though I used fields as an exemplification of an unobservable causal mechanism before, there are probably other structures like network structures which are linked to individual people, net nodes of people or of institutions and where those people and institutions are visible. And um, so we, we might be able to do something with that. So another, another question which has come up is, is one about how you actually put the notion of emergence and stratification and levels to work in actual research practice. So um, how do you actually go about uh, distinguishing between different levels of structure? How do you um, determine which ones are, are kind of are, are relevant or, or irrelevant? And I, I think this is a question you should be able to hit out of the park since it's definitely one that um, I know you thought a lot about in, um, you know, in the devil's handwriting, which you've thought a lot about in your, your recent attempts to theorize transnational, global, uh, and colonial fields. Well, maybe I could give an example from my work on German colonialism and the devil's handwriting. I think that's a good one, too, because it may be able to tease out some of the distinctions we were just making. I basically tried to explain, and I started with a actualist comparison between different comparative different forms of native colonial policy in different colonies trying to explain why in some cases the german colonizers engaged in genocide and in others they engaged in protection and in others they seem to mo move into a kind of a civilizational exchange with the people that they were colonizing it seemed to require some theoretical work to figure that out and the made and so i looked into the main theoretical approaches and sort of systematically checked them off. So it didn't seem that the causal mechanisms or causal powers associated with economic theories and Marxism were able to make much sense of these policies. It didn't seem like um, a geopolitical approach, at least one that stayed at the level of general, uh, general uh, requirements of geopolitics could explain these variations. So I had to dig down deeper, and, it's, and then there's a set of mechanisms that are arguably, or causal powers that are arguably more observable and some that are less observable and get into the question of emergence. The observable ones have to do with the pre-colonial racial representations of the people that are being colonized, and those are never um, unobservable. They're always observable texts, even though certain textual practices of analysis allowed me to figure out what the major arguments and tropes of those were and to construct a kind of a field of possible representations. Nonetheless, that exists at the level of the empirically evident. The other two, though, I think that I, the other two causes that I ended up using to explain that and found to be the most powerful were less immediately observable. The first one I've already mentioned, which is the concept of social field. And by constructing the colonial state as a social field, I was able to make sense of certain historical shifts uh, in policy that wouldn't otherwise have been, have been rational, have been explicable. For example, the shift toward a politics of genocide in German Southwest Africa involved a shifting in the field of power or the field of the colonial state within German Southwest Africa, sort of the local colonial field. And to understand the moves that the different people made, I had to reconstruct their social properties and the transformations they typically underwent within the overseas colonial sphere so that aristocracies, ed university educated um, Sanskritists and Orientalists and people like that and bourgeois investors all invested the colonial state with a certain set of social properties, but under those underwent certain systematic transformations as a result of that field. So that's something that's not immediately uh, empirically uh, evident and involved a kind of an abstraction from reality. But the one that is the most, the third, 
which is is the most obviously linked to a non-observable causal mechanism or power. Pro really a mechanism to use Phil's uh, way of talking about that earlier is the idea of the unconscious identifications of colonizers with the people they're colonizing. And in certain cases I was able to, I think I was able to show that um, certain changes in colonial policy and actions on the part of colonizing officials could only be explained in terms of these unconscious identifications, even though of course I don't have any empirical evidence of that because these are dead people who didn't have psychoanalysts at the time who wrote down what they were thinking. The, there's a kind of a retroductive um, logic through which the actions seem only to make sense in terms of a model of identification and of fantasy projection fantasy formation and projection. And so I think in a way that's an interesting way of thinking about those three causal mechanisms, the one that has to do with discourse or representation, the one that has to do with social fields, and the one that has to do with unconscious representations and fantasies and projections in that they go deeper and deeper into levels of, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, unobservable causal powers. Now, uh, is that, I, uh, so that, that's the answer, I guess. Okay, so I have one last question for you, George. And mm -hmm. this, this is a question I think about um, the degree of abstraction that is involved in generating real types. So um, in our earlier discussion of real types, you mentioned, for example, the social field, uh, the unconscious, for instance, and um, I guess the the question is: um, Are are there more? Are there more? Are these just sort of general instances, and there are more specific types, or is this? A, or, or would we? Should we rather think about there being? Um, uh, types of lower generality or lower scale? I don't know, I guess it's really a question about whether real types have to be of, of that kind of, at that kind of scale and generality or whether uh, there could also be real types that would be operating you know, only in a specific context or which would be operating say in small group dynamics or something like that. Well, first of all, I think you could, if if the term, if the concept of real type makes sense, it could be applied to all of those things. And secondly, I really, uh, I think it it could be a concept that's used to make sense of empirical phenomena like the state, or even a given event like the French Revolution, as well as causal powers of which, say, the unconscious is an example or um, field and causal structures or causal powers. And both of those, I think, the, the real type approach suggests that we should, instead of one-sidedly accentuating certain aspects of them that are currently of interest to us, we should try to understand how these things are working. And um, uh, with the example of field and unconscious, those, ex those show also how it's not just our own individual conception of how they're working, but there's a whole body of other research which has been working away at these concepts for quite a long time and giving more and more evidence about how these should be thought of and whether there's evidence for certain ways of thinking about them or not. Um, I mentioned earlier the unconscious. I mean, we had to wait more than a century for neuro, neuro, neurological cognitive psychologists to show that there actually were, they don't this unconscious social thinking processes. They, they haven't definitely argued that they work the same way that psychoanalysis argues, but at least, at, at the very least, it was a, a safe thing to do to talk about things that couldn't be seen and for which we only had um, event level um, evidence to go on. And uh, with fields, I think um, it's, a, it's a similar thing. I mean, you know, what, what, what value, what, what, what realistic value does field have as opposed to say a concept like network or institution? Well, it seems to explain empirical level events, but there needs to be this constant dialectical moving back and forth between the concept of field and these events that we're trying to explain and the evidence about them. So I think real type is more of an orientating, um, an orientating procedure, again, going back to the idea of thinking about a meta theory, and it's a meta theoretical set of assumptions, not a theoretical set of claims about specific objects. 
All right, George. Well, um, we're we're coming towards the end of our time here, um, and you've uh, really fielded an awful lot of questions. So, um, thanks an awful lot again for pulling together this great uh, presentation for us today. We've had a, a couple of folks ask um, about uh, where web, where they how they might access uh, webinar recordings, and um, if you're looking at your screen, you'll see. Uh, some more information about that. I think the sticking point uh, may be that you have to go in and register again in order to access uh, access the recordings. But um, uh, Tim Rutzow here are uh, are uh, among who wears many hats for us, uh, amongst others, uh, IT specialist extraordinaire, assures me that the recordings uh, are up and available uh, for those who who would like to listen to them. So uh, please do. Uh, if, uh, give them a listen if you're if you're interested. And um, um, last uh, last note is I just like to um, uh, encourage any of you who are out there who are um, interested to consider applying for um, one of the uh, working groups uh, for young scholars that we've uh, we've been advertising. You'll also find uh, information about those on the Critical Realism Network. Uh, website. So uh, thanks again for tuning in, and um, I hope that we'll have an opportunity um, to uh, have Webkeen and others on here soon. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Goodbye. It was a great conversation. <laughs>